Time with Imperat, Head of Design, Chief Designer, UX, UI Guru, Beautician of All Things in Mobile and Social Applications at Golden Gecko. Uh, so, Kim, please tell us, what is your approach in creating a great user experience and why do you think it works? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me, Babar. It's my pleasure to be here speaking with you guys today. Uh, I will share my screen with you so you can follow a little bit of a UX and UI deck presentation that we have. You let me know when you can see it. Perfect. All right. So uh, UX and UI design, differentiate through design, uh, and why UX is important. Uh, why UX matters? Yeah, if you take, for example, uh, a car as pretty as this one and cool as this one, uh, the Batmobile, it's, it's for example, uh, a car, it has an engine, it has wheels, it, has, uh, it needs to take you from point A to B. But if we don't know more than that, uh, it could easily end up being something completely, completely different. Just as cool, but it could be something uh, looking more like this. Um, so the design is to plan and make something for a specific user purpose. Design is a problem solving. And with a UX mindset, we design for users in a context, not for separate features in the list. So even though uh, the user of these two vehicles could be the absolutely the same person, it could be Bruce Wayne, but it's for a completely different situation in the con uh, context. One is fighting crime in Gotham City, and the other one is, for example, being when he's on vacation and needs space for a surfboard and what's or not. And UX is not a step in the process. It's in everything that we do. So uh, more than anything, this is a project philosophy, not just a set of tools and methods and deliverables. Uh, and the key principle for a UX project is to ensure that we involve the users in the process. Uh, because we can always get feedback uh, from them that is very, very that is needed to to um, create a UX for the user's needs. Great. And a solid UX work will result in, of course, better products, cheaper to fix problems, less risk, better ability to deliver the, to deadline and avoid scope creep, uh, deeper insight, and so on and, and uh, so on. And it's only good and positive things if we have this philosophy from start. And also, uh, again, even though we do the planning ideation, the UX and design development, the QA measure and enhancement, so on, usability testing needs to be a part of the project. Uh, it doesn't have to be in between all of these steps, but it needs to be in part of the project, either in the beginning, in the middle, or in the, in the end, or at all of these different phases. Uh, we also consider when we're working, of course, there are different types of clients, so we need to know who, what type of client we're facing and working with. So we have a visual client who, for example, loves art and graphic design <clears throat> and very strong reaction and opinions about what things should look like. Uh, and we have the data client who wants to hear us defend our design decision based on evidence data, uh, user research and design theory. And we also have the detail client, of course, who wants to know exactly which people to work with, uh, and a little bit of everything. Um, so it's good to know what kind of client we're facing before starting a project as well. Then we have the level of UI customization. Uh, there's the mini, there's the moderate standard, which I think is the one we do the most, and we also have the full UI customization. And this is also important to know uh, what, to, what to do before starting up a project. If it's uh, using mostly native components that the SDK provides, or if it's uh, uh, tweaking stuff and doing some more customized approach, or if it's actually going all in, doing a full UI customization. And this, of course, the affects a little bit the time and, and cost. <laughs> then we have the app concept, which is, is it a single focus, is it a typical focus, or is it a complex uh, concept? For example, a single focus might be um, an app such as notes, reminders, or contacts, only one of these. And then we have the typical concept, which is one of these with some added, uh, less loosely related features, or if it's a complex concept with, uh, for example, take a product of our own, which is called Movie, which includes a lot of different uh, uh, components to, to in, in the same app. 
production team we can skip. Then we also have the scoping design phase. Uh, with uh, We always have, at the beginning of a project, when uh, we have a large emphasis on the UX and design work uh, to get that on board as early on in the project. And what we actually try to do here is to, uh, in the scope and the design phase, the end deliverable of that is to have a prototype ready based on something I will explain a little bit further down the line, wireframes or mockups. And we do usability testing on that to see if uh, we understand the requirements and the needs and everything, the flows, everything works as it should before moving into development. Then we have the, a little bit about the term, terminology of activities and deliverables. Um, first of all, we have the stakeholder interviews. And this is just for, for you guys to also understand a little bit the process that we, uh, many years of work, we think works very good to uh, include all of this in the process. So stakeholder interviews is uh, when we sit down with the key stakeholders to understand the business requirements and deeper understanding of the client's need. And then we have, uh, goes a little bit hand in hand, it can be extended to a workshop when we uh, sit in a group to discuss, can be for a day or two or even more, and we sit uh, to get even further deeper understanding of the project and important insights uh, that always come out from, from having conversations with people involved in the project. But also something that is very important, see, take, see what others do good and uh, less good, uh, and uh, uh, competitor benchmarking. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's always good to see what others does, to be uh, take inspirations or, or see what hasn't really worked. Then we work always with something uh, that we call user stories. And a user stories, there are short narrative texts that describe an interaction between the user and the app. Uh, and it, for example, it can be, uh, as a user, I want to create, edit my profile. As a user, I want to enter my account details. As a user, I want to store my credit card information, for example. And but with these user stories, we understand, uh, uh, it's the first step to understand uh, what, what the app should be all about or the solution if it's a web. Then we uh, go to the next step, which is the app map and information architecture. So this is a high level diagram uh, representing the information hi hierarchy within the app. Uh, so this, or the solution, so this document is focused on uh, what screens that will contain and how different screens are linked together by labeled arrows and boxes. Then we go into what is, I think, the most important deliverable for, for a solution. So this is called wireframes, and this is uh, like a blueprint. Um, it represents the whole app in a skeletal framework. Uh, shows navigation structure, representative or call to action. Um, yeah, where imagery goes, where button goes, uh, where, where text goes and so on. And this, this document is not about colors, or it's not about making something pretty. It's about understanding how the solution works and where all the graphical elements is placed in the solution. And the wireframes can be presented uh, to uh, explain the whole flow with something we call a wireframe flow chart. So this can be separate flows, explained with separate flows, or it can be just one big map connecting all the screens and see where uh, everything, how everything is linked. But this is, uh, again, the most important, I think, deliverable for, for a project. Uh, nothing should, development should re not really be starting before this is uh, as much in place as possible. Of course, you can be agile and keep on working after having done the testing and so on to update this. But this is, uh, if we start, for example, doing graphical, uh, more visual design, uh, when this is not in place, it's, for example, like uh, take a house, for example. You have four walls that you you will need to know how these walls are connected together before you paint them. Because if you paint them very, very pretty before you know how to connect them, the walls fall over. So very, very important deliverable. Then we have a mood board. So this is a little bit more in when, when a client or a, doesn't really have a a graphical profile or, or a brand guidelines is to uh, set the tone and look and feel of how the app will, will look. And then it, we take this as uh, something to work with, to understand 
what fonts to use, which colors to use, what images to use, and so on. And then we move into the visual design mockups, which is something uh, most people uh, think is the most fun part to work with, even though we as designers, we think everything is <laughs> very, very interesting and fun to work with. But this is maybe mo most easily to understand. Uh, when you, you see something and if it's, uh, you understand the images, buttons, colors, and so on, and fonts. So what we do first is we create a visual design uh, concept, which contains of three to five uh, designs for the most representing screens in the application. And we, we have that one approved. And when that is uh, approved with the client, we keep on designing all the rest of the mockups for the solution. Then we do prototyping. And this can be done with both low fidelity prototyping and high fidelity prototyping. Low fidelity prototyping is based more of, on sketches or wireframes to uh, control and check that the flows are, are working as they should. We have understood uh, what the client is after and the user is after. Um, and the high fidelity prototype is a little bit more, uh, is actually more representative of what the final product would be. So this is based on either mockups um, and can even include, uh, if we want to, even simple animations and so on. Graphical assets, this is something we provide the developers when we go into development. So if we have a customized, customized element that is not native, we need to provide the actual image of that uh, graphical asset. Then we also have something that we call the design implementation guidelines. And this is something that we provide uh, to our developers for them to understand fully how alignments are, how margins should be which colors to use, which fonts, which font sizes, and so on. So this is a very, very important internal uh, document for when working with the development phase. And this is something uh, that is extremely important, the usability testing. Uh, so this is when we measure and observe how the users are actually uh, navigating through the app. If there are anything that doesn't really work, if there are anything that is very difficult to understand in the solution, uh, and then with this process, the UX lead can explore concepts, terminology, navigation, content, page layout, and functionality. Uh, and for now, for iOS, what we're using is a tool called Lookback IO, which is very, very, uh, very, very interesting and very, very good to use. For Android, there's not really something that's uh, that, that complete in, ter in terms of a tool. So we can also use there still the, the camera recording to do that. But it's very, very important to capture the, we let the user, when they do the user testing, to speak out their mind loudly so we can really, really follow and, and hear the, the thoughts of the user when navigating through the app. And we also, of course, see, see how the user reacts when, uh, with different ter terminology and navigation. And the testing can be done on either the low fidelity prototype, the high fidelity prototype, or the real app. And there's also different types of usability testing. There is uh, guerrilla testing, there is the lab testing, there is the contextual testing, and then the remote testing. And the guerrilla testing is basically that you can go into a pub and sit down to somebody that, there and ask them to, uh, if, if, if we write them a beer, if they can test the application to see how, um, how that goes. And we also have a lab testing, which is a, a, a controlled environment. So we sit down here, for example, in the office or in the client's office to uh, take in the users and um, go through the application together with them. Um, a little bit, the, the image that was displayed before uh, was a representative of what the lab testing can be. Then we also have the contextual testing, which, which might be, for example, let's say that we have a, a cooking app or a bakery app when, when we want users to uh, bake bread or make a, yeah, a recipe of some sort. And actually, to put uh, the testing into the in the context, so we have we're in the kitchen and we see how a user actually is doing uh, baking a bread, for example, and we might see that uh, with the hands dirty, there's no way that the user can actually touch the screen to move to the next part of the recipe. So we might actually need to have a voice control to uh, voice recognition to go to the next page, for example. And then we have the remote testing that is uh, very similar to lab testing, but you're, you're, we're sitting on different locations. Tasks, I think we can skip. 
but task, well, very quickly, <laughs> task is, is uh, included in the usability testing, something that we we want, when we want to test different flows or different buttons we're not sure of, for example, or different icons, uh, we a little bit, uh, not too much, guide the the user of what kind of task we want the user to, to perform uh, during the usability testing without guiding. Very important. Then there are different testing activities, of course, for example, A to B testing, when we have, in this case, for example, a hamburger menu versus a dashboard. Uh, testing the two approaches and see which uh, the users respond uh, more positively towards. And then there are, there are a lot of other uh, UX activities that can be done, for example, the expert reviews, ideation workshops, or analytics. And the expert reviews is something that we, for example, do when we go in and uh, do a complete evaluation of, for example, an existing application or website uh, and identify usability issues in terms of uh, uh, efficiency of flows, assessment of best practice in navigation, layout, behavior, interface, and other attributes. And this, for us, I think is the recipe for a success for a good, good project. OK, great. Thanks for sharing that, Kim. Um, the second question is, uh, you know, could you share along the lines of your um, exceptional user experiences created, uh, could you share uh, an application that you've worked on in the user experience space that has contributed to success of the project and the success in this particular context could mean anything from uh, brand awareness, preference building, referrals, or conversions, as you mentioned with usability and testing with, uh, with a final user beyond the customer, maybe an agency or maybe a brand? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, this is... This is uh something that we try and apply to all of our products, the process that I just went through. Um, in some of the cases, uh, we can reach success even though that this is actually not followed, but if that's good marketing by the brand or if that's uh, uh, pure luck, that's something completely different. But this is the process that we uh, nowadays apply to 200% to of our products. So usability testing, for example, is something that we do for 100% of our products. Uh, and we have um, a project that is recently something that we've been working with, which is Addison Lee, for example. It's still, we still need to see if that's, that's a success uh, coming out of that, but I don't know if it was... I, I'm not good with numbers, but I don't know if it was uh, 80,000 downloads or something like that. Then we also have uh, Navras Oredo in Oman, which uh, have a huge amount of downloads as well. And then we have uh, Heathrow Airport, which... Uh, yeah, also have been a very, very successful app with a million downloads or something like that, I think. But uh, what's important also to, to think about is that uh, once, once an app or solution has been uh, released, the, the, the job doesn't stop there. That's really, really when the most important part uh, starts because we always need to optimize uh, a solution and go back and see uh, what works and what doesn't work. But, okay. but these are the examples that, that have worked very well. Okay, great. Um, and you know, the main reason I got in touch with you because you have a very impressive slide share that's um, making the rounds uh, uh, called 10 Design Trends for 2014. It's gotten over 50,000 views, which is a feat in itself. And I'd like to be able to uh, get a feeler from you about, um, you know, how have they performed the 10 design trends that you predicted for 2014? And so how have they performed in the past in terms of reach and making the right predictions? And finally, if you could share, what do you think would be the trends moving into 2014, as uh, 2015? Yep. This is a very, very exciting interview. Eh? You should call me up more often, Babar, I think. <laughs> I will, I will share this. I will. I will definitely will. I will share the screen with you uh, again. Let's see here. So this 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 is as as Babar mentioned here. We, we for for every year we do uh, a deck where we go through the the top ten trends that we think will be for the year, and I think. Uh, if we go back to the one we did for 2013, this usually comes up actually when, when before uh, the big 
platform giants as iOS, uh, well, Apple, uh, Google, Android, and uh, and Windows, for example, before they actually come up with their new releases of, of OSs. So I think we have, uh, in some cases, it's a bit scary because we think that there might be a camera here somewhere. Uh, you're quite, quite on the spot, I think, uh, when we do this. And this is also the way I see it with, with, with trends. It's, it's always uh, developers, uh, and it, it's, it's an ongoing dialogue between these, uh, with all the platform giants and, and the developers, because uh, trends is not only about uh, following them, I think. It's, it's also having the courage enough to actually set the trends yourself. Um, and uh, as again, it's, it's an ongoing dialogue with, 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 between platform giants and the developers to to see what can be improved and explore more. Uh, and this, uh, so the first trend that we had for this year, uh, a little bit of recap, was layered interfaces. Uh, and what we discussed the year before was that the skeuomorphic designs was something that was completely disappearing from, from the map. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're moving uh, towards two-dimensional interfaces. It's quite the contrary. So interfaces will become more layered and taking full advantage of, of, of the S-axis. And this approach gives a sense of depth to the interface, making the experience more tangible. Um, for example, uh, with the menus, there's also, uh, you can see today that there are, when, for example, if you want to go back into the, uh, in the navigation, you will see that a screen is on top of another screen. So that's very, a very, very smart way of, of, of letting the users know where I am in the navigation. Then we have something that uh, we call divide by elements and spacing, not lines. And this is, again, the whole, the whole concept that we have when we're working is to make everything as simple as possible, as intuitive as possible, and always having in, in mind uh, the concept of less is more. So if we don't need an element, if we don't need a feature, if we, if we don't, it's, it's, we have the approach, why, why keep it if it doesn't make any, any if it don't, doesn't bring any value? So this goes a little bit aligned with this as well. So if, if we can separate elements instead with using, as you can see in the sample here, using uh, graphical layouts, with using colors, using uh, blocks, using uh, different uh, graphical elements in, in, in lines, you can easily, easily create uh, and separate the different parts of a solution that way instead. And it just gives a very, very clean and nice interface. And this was the one that I think you didn't fully agree with me upon, but uh, this is something we call swipe, 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 and we think it will actually be something that will be even more and more, because this, this is something that also goes in line with something we have in this deck as well, which is thumb-focused navigation. And this is also something that goes hand-in-hand, uh, hand because we will get, uh, since we have bigger and bigger devices as well, it's important to, uh, to keep as much as possible uh, with small, small gestures as possible. So in this case, for example, what we have in the example to the left is you have a long press, which is actually something that we will, we, we think will be something of a trend for 2015, uh, which gives you different options. So you long press, you hold down, you will get different options, and you just swipe towards one of those options, which is a very, very quick and efficient uh, way of, of, of navigating, we think. And then you have, of course, in this case, we can swipe from anywhere of the left side uh, of, of the screen to go to the menu or to go back. So it doesn't matter if you have big hands or small hands. The user experience is is very, very similar for 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 everyone. And then we also have, for example, uh, the swipe of uh, deleting objects or even doing other things with. Uh, if you have a list view such as this one, or for example, mailbox, depending how long you swipe it actually gives you different options, which is something that we think is very, very interesting. And we will see more of next year, we think. And this is a little bit also what I mentioned before, the thumb-focused uh, thumb interaction. Since the devices also is, are getting bigger, um, and again, uh, people's hands are different sizes, it's, it's a very good thing to, to keep in mind when doing the designs. And people don't want to use two hands when using a smartphone for uh, interacting with, with the solutions. Uh, simple color schemes. Uh, yeah, so again, with the approach, less is more. Keep it simple. 
don't overdo with colors. Keep keep it to one, two, or three. Uh, but also take into account that, uh, for example, colors can be used for a call to action. So if we want to the users to, for example, uh, press something, then we can highlight that more with using a certain color. And it's as he says, for example, uh, if you have uh, in the same solution, you have uh, two buttons next to each other, one being red, one being green. That usually communicates, uh, not maybe for all that are colorblind, but it, it usually uh, communicates that uh, red is warning and green is okay, for example. And this is something that we saw an explosion of this year and something that we, is a very good solution to keep in mind also for next year. But it's, it's actually if icons are active or not active, uh, stroke versus fill. So it's a very, very simple thing to do and a very, very effective thing to do uh, to keep in mind also for next year. And we also mentioned a little bit about animations. Do it well or don't do it at all. Um, and we also see, for example, in uh, if we take uh, the last version for, for, from uh, the, the OS for the desktop for, for Apple uh, uh, machines, for example, we, there was a lot of animations going on there for uh, uh, creating a new uh, document in text edit, for example, that animated out. And the first time it was quite fun to see, but after a couple of times it was just very, very annoying. And that's also something that we see that completely removed from the, the last update that has been done. So do it well or, or, or don't do it at all. You know, it, it also has to do with the solution. If you do a, animations need to be slick and they need to be uh, well done in terms of details is what we think. This is something that we think will come to change a little bit for 2015, this approach. But this, again, goes with the less is more. Uh, keep it simple. So one app, one typeface. Um, and one, one typeface, for example, you have m many, many different uh, options of treating it differently. If you go bold, if you use caps, uh, simple text, and so on. You can, uh, you can play around with this one typeface and, and create a very, very beautiful and simple interface. What we think will come for 2015 a little bit more is to focus more on the actual legibility of, of the text. So for example, if you have a long text that we want people to read, uh, or if we have a text that we want people to read, uh, it's it's going to be much more used, we think, of serif fonts and not so much about uh, straight fonts that we use because serif font is much easier to uh, to read through a text. So next year will be uh, can be a combination of fonts. For title, you use one, and for actually text, uh, a lot of serif fonts we, will, we think we will see more of. Then we have blur effects, and uh, this is uh, one of this is something that we think is absolutely fantastic solution in terms of UX uh, because it's you can easily uh, combine this again with layer interfaces, and uh, when blurring a background, you keep the image, but you can easily easily see what uh, the content is on top of of that image. And we think it's a very very um, good UX solution in general. We might grow tired of seeing it after 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 a while, but still, it's 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 a very very good UX solution. And then we have something that uh, we we call phablets. So 2014 was the year of the phablets, and a phablet. What is that? Yeah, it's a merge between a smartphone and a tablet, and includes the best of both worlds. Uh, and what we think we will see more of for uh, 2015 is with bigger screen sizes come different layouts. So we need, I think, to start to take into account a little bit more of uh, a responsive approach when it comes to uh, designing for the bigger devices, such as the ones that have come up this year, with, which is, uh, for example, the uh, Galaxy Note 3 and uh, what came out not so long ago, the iPhone 6 Plus. Also, Windows, of course, has have, have their phone on the market for a while. Other thing that is not included in this deck, what we think are uh, trends for 2015, uh, the ones that I haven't mentioned, we, we hope to see a little bit more about uh, wearables. We think that Google Glass has a very, very interesting approach, uh, and, and Google Glass is something that can be explored and, and made, made um, a lot of use of uh, in different areas. And we also 
I hope to see, or we hope to see a little bit, not only watches, but also actually flexible, uh, more bracelets kind of an approach for wearables that gives you a bigger space for uh, a bigger surface to for interactions. Okay, great. And when can we expect the uh, Trends for 2015 uh, slideshow or report to be released? Uh, in the beginning of uh, next year. So January 2015, you will have it out. All right, cool. And that's something that we take much... Thanks very much for taking out the time. Yeah, the, the trends is something we, we think is very funny, uh, something we take much pride in and something we really, really enjoy uh, doing as well. Yeah, definitely. So it's uh, just so uh, just so the audience is clear, uh, it's you and how many more people that come up with the trends report and what is the basis by which you're meeting creation, uh, you're making predictions for the next year? Uh, we take into account uh, the whole design team actually, which which is about uh, 20 people. So everybody comes okay. up with their input, and everybody have we have a, a couple of sessions or three or four that we, we go through and sit down and we discuss what we think will be the trends for next year. And a very 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 talented team we have here. So it's it's a pleasure working with these guys. Definitely. Uh, so Kim, thanks very much for taking up the time uh, to speak to us, and uh, I'll let you get back to creating beautiful applications. And we'll be very happy to host you once again as soon as you've released the, the next 2015 report. So we've got first dibs on it, first of all. And secondly, we can talk about where you think the new additions that you bring into the table. Maybe it'll be the top 15 trends. We don't know. You're talking top 10 right now. There might be more on the table, considering how has come out with a phone that is pretty much another Samsung. Um, yeah. Anyway, so... Uh, all right. Uh, Thanks for any. Anyway, thanks again for taking out the time and uh, take care. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Bar. My pleasure. Looking forward to next time.